Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Lexi Neely, the program coordinator at Little Free Library, and I am pleased to welcome you to Little Free Library Unbound. My colleague and our director of programs, Shelby King, is in the chat. Um, she'll be sharing some helpful links and information today. Uh, if you have any tech questions, you can go ahead and send those to Shelby, and she will be sure to help out as soon as possible. If you have additional questions for our panelists today, um, anything we don't get to, you can feel free to leave those questions in the chat. And if we have time, um, we'll ask those at the end. Today, we are talking about an unfortunate but common experience for Little Free Library stewards, which is damage and vandalism. Some stewards never experience vandalism, while others have repeat offenders. Um, other times, extreme weather can take out a library or seriously damage it. And we know that however a library is damaged, it's always really heartbreaking and frustrating for the steward. Stewards dedicate time, money, and energy to maintaining their libraries, so it's no surprise that when they come up against vandalism or damage or other hiccups, um, they work really hard to bounce back. So that's what we're here to chat about today is, you know, the, the upside of these situations. How do people bounce back when things happen to their library? So today we'll be chatting with two stewards who have experienced damage or vandalism and found a way to recover so that they could keep sharing books. Joining us today is Anne Armstrong. She's the steward of charter number 140412 in Nashville, Tennessee, and founder of My Gnome on the Rome which is a brand of toys and tools that help families create adventure and make memories. Thanks for being here with us, Anne. Thank you. Next, we are joined by Rigel Cummins. He is the steward of Charter 85175 in Brooklyn, New York. Unfortunately, both Rigel and Anne have had instances of vandalism, but they're here today to share their tips and tricks for moving forward. So thanks, Rigel and Anne, for being here with us. Glad to be here. All right, so let's start with the first, um, the most obvious question, maybe. What kind of vandalism or damage have you experienced? And do you want to answer first? Sure. I've actually been vandalized twice. <laughs> um, the first time we built um, uh, the library that you see there on the right was made out of a mailbox, not just any mailbox, but an important mailbox to someone that we tried to upscale. And the side of it was a little gnome library. It was really adorable. Um, and somebody broke into that to um, steal the items inside. And so uh, the second time you see the, the two on the left, we rehabbed and then somebody came and ripped the door off of it. <laughs> oh, that is the worst. I'm so sorry to hear that. How about yourself, Rigel? Well, uh, mine was actually on Halloween last year, someone egged my, my local library. As you can see, there were eggs on the outside, which I need like to get a picture of, and also several eggs were smashed on the inside, ruining 20-something books and also making my fears that it was going to smell bad. But this, I believe, was clearly the work of, of teenagers. So, uh, which was very disappointing to me because I had just held a Halloween book event uh, where I gave out more, nearly 400 children's books for Halloween in my neighborhood. So it was a definite letdown off of, off of a very successful event. But keep moving. Yeah. Absolutely. How about that writing in the picture on the right? That was actually something recently in my, my new library. Um, mine was eventually replaced. As you can see from my cleaning picture, it was already kind of fading and cracking. And I was planning on getting a new one anyway. And my sister purchased me a new one for my birthday. Uh, that is, someone had done some graffiti in my library. I actually posted some pictures on Facebook and on the stewards group. And a number of people ran sort of translation programs on it. And it is believed to be, it is either Arabic or Hindi. And it apparently appears to be a blessing. So I left it. It's on the, the floor of the, of the library. So it's, it's not 
you know, de really defacing anything. So I actually have left it because it seems positive. Gotcha. Thank you. So how did both of you find out about the damage? Um, you know, is your is your library located somewhere where you looked out the front window one day and were like, oh, no, something horrible has happened? Or did someone let you know? Would you like me to start? Sure, yes. The first time ours was damaged, I had gone to refill it um, and saw that it had been, you know, smashed up. Um, strangely, <laughs> people continued to use it, even if it was destroyed. It, um, it continued to kind of debilitate over time, but um, that's how I found out the first time. The second time, after we had rehabbed it, somebody in the neighborhood posted a picture and said, what happened to it? <laughs> and I was like, we just fixed that last week. Are you serious? And that started a thread on our neighborhood Facebook page that was, that gained actually a lot of support. So some people from the neighborhood actually volunteered to repair what had happened the second time. So good things happen. <laughs> right. Rigel, how did you find out about the damage to your library? Uh, my library is directly in front of my house. And I actually came out that morning to uh, do an inventory. I inventory my library Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays as part of an ongoing program I'm doing. And, and I realized there were eggs on the outside on, on the roof. And I opened up and looked inside. And at first I was like, oh, good, there's nothing in here. And I looked closer and saw there was egg on a lot of the books. So, um, yes, I was very annoyed. Um, I cleaned it out. I went through the books for my records and also to see if any of them were savable. None of them were. They all had gotten egg on them, corners and edges. Um, so I disposed of the books. I cleaned it out. I actually removed the, the, the door from it temporarily because I wanted to let it air out. Um, fortunately, my library faces into the sun for a lot of time, and it, uh, I was concerned that it might get smelly. Uh, so I wanted to let the sun cook it clean. But yeah, I took a sponge and bucket of soapy water and, and scrubbed it out as best I can. And as I said, about a month later, I, my sister gave me the new one that she had cleaned up for me, and I replaced it. So a number of people did come by when I was cleaning it out and commented on it. All seemed to be very sympathetic. But And yeah, it continued in use. So. Right, yeah. It's interesting to see, you know, Clearly, the resource is so valuable in the community that people are still trying to use it or coming by to use it and don't realize um, or even do realize or are just trying to work around whatever damage happened to it. Um, so, Anne, you shared a bit about how the community responded to the damage. And I believe you said um, that someone else had posted about it. So in instances where you've had damage because you've you've both had multiple situations that you've dealt with this. Did you reach out to people and ask for help? Did people come to you? What has that experience been like? Anne, do you want to start? Sure. The first time, to be honest, I was rather, I spent a lot of money. I, you know, I was starting my own business. Um, I'm a teacher. <laughs> so, you know, th there is no silver spoon, so to speak. So I, I poured a lot of money into it the first time and I was kind of so kicked in the gut the first time that I just kind of went quiet. Um, and it was there to provide books to kids while they were at the playground. It's in a public space. It's not in my yard. And I think probably if it had been in my yard, I might have felt more sort of personally violated, if that makes sense, you know, oh, yeah, but it's in a public place. And, and um, so that makes it a little bit trickier. And, you know, I did enough years as a social worker to know that when you do things as a service, sometimes they, you get taken advantage of, but it doesn't make the efforts of getting, you know, or the books that get into the right hands, like, or it's, it's worth the trade-off, I guess, for me, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. Well, and then the on? second time, you know, they really rose to the occasion on their own. 
That's great. I didn't have to ask because they, they offered. That's because I live in a great neighborhood where people really reach out to each other. That's wonderful. Uh, well, with mine, um, I have a lot of people in my neighborhood who participate in using the Little Free Library. Uh, invariably, I actually don't end up putting many books into it. I mean, occasionally there it, it empties out and I have to put stuff in. But overall, my neighborhood gets a lot of traffic, both people taking books and people donating books. I'm fairly certain there's some people in my neighborhood who are uh, book reviewers professionally because I get a lot of um, the you know, pre-release copies of books donated. So, um, I mean, as I said, people who walked by and saw the sign and saw the cleaning up all seem to be sympathetic of it. Um, but, uh, and I think people came and put more books in afterwards, but there was nothing specific, really. Gotcha. So, um, a little bit more on the repair and rebuild. So, obviously, when you first set up your library, um, you know, you put a lot of time and energy and funds and resources into it. And rebuilding feels like a big hurdle. You know, there's there's the emotional aspect of someone, like Anne said, you know, taking advantage of a service you're offering um, that really hurts, um, is hurtful. And then there's, you know, the logistical kind of realistic aspect of it of how do I, how do I put something new together so that I can keep doing this? Do you have any tips for anyone who is maybe at that stage and they're wondering, well, what do I do next? You know, I, I've hit this hurdle and maybe I don't have the resources to buy a new library or build one. Um, do you have any suggestions or anything that you thought about while you were kind of figuring out how to troubleshoot this? I will say that I, you know, so, like I said, somebody else put it on Facebook, which I think make, makes it a little more credible possibly, but um, I used the neighborhood um, and just posted about it and people contributed their own ideas on how to repair it. Some people said don't repair it because it's just going to happen again. And, um, you know, there was a discussion. It wasn't just a asking for help. There was people really contributing to the conversation um, that led to some people said, hey, we've got some old windows that belong to old houses in the neighborhood we can't do anything with. You know, let us know if we can give that. And somebody, you know, it was just a really kind of uh, collective that just came from having conversations with people. That's so great. Well, with mine, um, I actually built mine initially from scrap wood and a door from an old cabinet. So it, it didn't cost me that, I mean, it cost me time and effort, but it didn't cost me much monetarily. Um, and actually prior to that, I had been thinking, I, because it had been three, uh, for roughly three years, and it had been getting a lot of, you know, it was a lot of sun damage and the paint was peeling. And I was already thinking of replacing it. And I'd actually, a couple, like a month or so before, I'd actually salvaged from uh, down the street. I'm a half a block from a New a University public school, an elementary school. And there was this wooden, um, supposed to look like a refrigerator, like cabinet, a small one that I had actually, I was out in the trash and I saw it and I checked it out. I was like, this looks clean. And I was actually working on some plans for, to use it to replace my library if I could figure out a way to make the door waterproof. Um, and after, after the vandalism, I was still considering that, but, and I was even thinking of just buying one of the new, the heavy duty plastic ones that the door for our organization does because I do have the resources to afford it. Um, but that was when my sister warned me not to because, well, I had to act like it was a surprise, but her and <laughs> my nephew were painting a new kit they had gotten from Little Survivor. And so that all ended up working out. Uh, but it is one of the things I definitely, I, I just, when I built my original one, I just used the downloaded pro, um, uh, blueprint from the Little Free Library website and the scrap wood that I salvaged from our, my basement and garage. So it is, it's not as expensive as, as, a, as one might think. I mean, there's definitely, you have to put time and effort into it, but 
you know, you can usually salvage something pretty good. Yeah, that's true. The, uh, the creative ways that people upcycle um, old furniture or old appliances um, is it always blows our mind to see what kind of creative ideas people can come up with. And, you know, if you're, if your library is damaged or vandalized um, and you are ready to get back into it and have another library, but maybe it's just not feasible right now, there are in-between steps you can take. Um, we see a lot of really creative solutions in the Facebook group, for example. You know, sometimes just a Rubbermaid tub full of books um, does the job. You bring it in at night so the books don't get wet. Um, and people do that for their libraries regardless of damage or vandalism sometimes too. Um, that's one of my favorite things about Little Free Libraries is that they can be anything, you know, anything that kind of keeps the books dry and clean and makes them available. Um, so that versatility, I think it is an asset when it comes to kind of coming back from maybe a negative experience. Um, I wanted to share some pictures of your renewed libraries. Um, and did you want to say anything about your new setup? Well, this is not the new setup. Sadly, this is the old setup. <laughs> but gotcha. uh, but the the other one that we did set up um, was is covered with moss and bark and enameled, and it was upcycled from a piece of furniture, like you mentioned a little bit ago. Um, we hired, we have a, a cool little agency here in our town called, it's a, it's a creative reuse center. So people donate things and then other people kind of go and you can pay whatever you want for whatever is there. Um, so I've used that as a resource to kind of continue to upcycle. And they also have artists that work with them. So we hired an artist through there to create the new one and it's so that's been really fun that's awesome and here we have a couple pictures of rigel's his older library and now his new one anything you want to add about those oh well this is actually this is a picture from the event i did on halloween and actually the wooden box next to it on its side that is the refrigerator shaped thing i was talking about that i was planning on replacing it with um but yeah, as you can see, we did this event, I, I call it Trick or Read for Halloween. I first did it in 2020, 2020 when COVID was, we weren't really going to give out candy for Halloween. So initially that time, I just filled my library with kids' books and some signs telling people, and it was very popular. And then in 2021, um, people in our local neighborhood Facebook group had, in about a week or so before Halloween, expressed a wonder if I was going to, if they were saying, whoever operates the little library, if they were going to do that again. And I said that I was planning on it, and a number of people responded with, "Do you can, will you be accepting donations of books?" And I received something like five or ten bags full of books left on my porch uh, in the next week, which is how I was able to give out, I believe, it was nearly four hundred books and thirty-five pounds of children's toys. Um, but yeah, and this is the new one that my sister had purchased and painted with the help of my nephew. As you can see, it is decorated in the style of the blanking on his name, but the, with the purple crayon. Uh, it's got art on all four sides. It's very lovely. Um, That's I, awesome. These new, the, these one, this is one from the from Little Free Library Company. My sister did modify it so the door has an internal latch, so it, you push it close and it stays closed. Sometimes people leave the door open. My previous one just had a little magnetic one from the cut that I salvaged from the cover. Very cool. Thank you for sharing. Harold and the purple crayon, someone said in the, the chat. I was blanking on it too. Very, very sweet design. I love that. Um, someone also asked in the chat about, you know, when books get cleared out. Um, this is something we've addressed in the Facebook group a lot. I believe we've, we've talked about it a lot um, on Unbound too on previous episodes. So if you haven't seen those, definitely check our YouTube page um, for previous episodes where we've talked about that. But um, do either of you have experience with people taking all the books out of your library that you'd want to speak on or share advice? Uh, I have had it up happen a few times in the last few months. Um, but uh, my response to when people emptied out is 
I put out more books. I may also make an effort to put out stuff that I was less likely to put out, like magazines or books that people, if someone's going to take everything, then here you can take this old computer manual from 1986 that nobody wants. Um, additionally, one of the things that's, start, that's been happening more with my library that I've been contributing to is putting in like non-book-like knickknacks. We've been clearing out a lot of stuff in our house. So like toys or you know, just small little things that are still perfectly usable. You're just like, I don't need this thing anymore. It has minimal sentimental value. Maybe somebody else would like it. And quite honestly, that sort of stuff seems to go very quickly. Um, as I said, toys especially go very quickly I'm down the street from a school and, and the New York City Public Library. So we get a huge amount of, and the number of um, playgrounds. So we get a lot of traffic of families and children uh, so much served for the fact that children's books generally don't last a day in my library. So, but yeah, my response is people take stuff. I'm just going to put out more stuff. I I don't feel as as aggressively upset as some people seem to when people clear out stuff. Because my general thing is people are clearing stuff either because they don't quite understand how the system works and just want the books, in which case fine, you want books, that's great. Uh, there may be people who are taking them to sell them, which is not as great, but if people are in that desperate a situation that the few dollars they can get from selling these used books is helpful to them, then someone is going to be reading those books and someone's getting a few bucks, and I'm not going to shame someone for that. So. Those are great points. Yeah, it can be super frustrating and disheartening to find your library totally empty and truly we can never know why someone took all of them or what they're doing with them um, but I think you made a really good point you know used books in particular have really low resale value um, so if someone is taking them to sell they likely need the money that doesn't make it any more disappointing or upsetting but if you think about it in that way I think it does Help it to feel less personal um, and of course it's it's wonderful to be able to just refill it again you know some folks um, leave it empty for a while and you know hope to see that the community um, brings forth some donations um, and kind of more actively takes a role in that exchange piece of it um, and other times folks will add books but not completely fill it so if the person comes back or someone else comes back and wipes it out again, less books are gone. Um, but yeah, like, like vandalism and damage, you know, clearing out of books happens to a lot of stewards. It happens multiple times to many folks. Um, it's definitely disappointing, but having, having um, as open of a mind as you can about it, I think really helps it from being really, really personally devastating, but it, definitely can understand um, why it may feel that way. And do you have any experience with um, kind of the book clear out situation? I mean, it's, it's unusual for me to fill our library up when it's not empty because it's at a playground and I feel sure, I'm sure there's people that come occasionally to, and sell things, but I too put in puzzles and yo-yos and other miscellaneous things. Um, we have a great buy nothing group here in our community on, and they, you know, I'm forever getting things from there. If I need them, you know, there's a, there's an infinite resource of, you know, books and other various tchotchkes when you <laughs> dig around a little bit, I think. Um, so I agree completely that, you know, it is, it's worth it to me to, even if people do clear it out, it's not unlike rolling down the window and giving, you know, a dollar to somebody who's standing there collecting money. I don't know if you have that in your communities, but we certainly have it here. And you don't necessarily know what they're going to do with it, but you can, if people are that desperate, then they, you know, there are worse things than contributing some books to them, I think. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, we have one more question. 
Did you change anything about your library or aside from the design or maybe the, the physical library, um, did you change anything about your library or your approach as a steward when you got started again? I started a group of a bunch of little libraries that are in a small proximity. Um, there's like a little art library. There's, you know, there's a collection where people paint rocks for each other. So it's a whole little community of um, sort of do-gooders. And I sort of collected all those people up on Facebook and made a group together because I think we can kind of hold each other up when, when that happens. I think that's why, like, this podcast is why um, the groups that we are in on – can be you know because people do support each other when you when you need it I think definitely uh, I don't think I really changed much about my I mean it was only out of use for a couple of days while I was letting it dry out um, although I do have to say um, similar to Anne's thing in my neighborhood there are a number of little free libraries uh, there's at least four other little free libraries within two blocks of me and, uh, and within three blocks, there are at least two little free pantries where people can put out uh, food and stuff. So um, in the last few months, I've been doing a thing because, mostly because there's one little free library at, near the school uh, on the other side of the block, which is primarily filled with kids' books, which when school is in session, empties out constantly because you have a constant traffic of children and parents picking up their kids, and it's right there at the schoolyard. So it got emptied up very quickly. And I always feel it's a shame when the libraries are sitting there empty. So I definitely started doing some of the book bombing with putting out kids' books, or at least books that are generally appropriate for, like, kids and teenagers. Because although it is an elementary school, I feel, you know, there's families, though, you know, everyone's going to take books from there. Um, so I generally, every week or so, I generally go around and and. <laughs> Check each of the little free libraries, and I'll tidy them up. Um, I because I said I do I tidy mine every day because it's right outside my house. At the very least, I go out there and I, I straighten it up, and if I see any trash or anything, I can take it out. And if it's pretty empty, I'll put some more stuff out. Um, so yeah, I've been doing that with some of the other little free libraries. We just had a new one pop up literally across the street from the school one, which I definitely thought was a, getting a little. I don't know, saturated the neighborhood, but, uh, you know, I don't feel it's any real harm. It's not like we're taking business from each other. Uh, so, so one thing I have actually found recently, I was cleaning out some stuff in my basement, and I found a whole bunch of old collectible trading card games from the 90s that I used to play a lot of, which are all not really worth any money at all. I've been putting those out into both my library and the other libraries in like little packs of cards, and they go incredibly quickly. I know, don't know if it's children taking them or adults or whatever, but those are a non-book thing that seems to be very popular. Yeah, it's always surprising to to find what goes in a library that you think, you know, maybe someone will be into this, maybe not, but everyone has such creative ideas. You know, I see in the Facebook group too, um, or even in my buy nothing group, my neighborhood buy nothing group, which Anne mentioned. Um, People will have magazines or old pieces of cardstock, and someone will say, I'll take them. I'm going to make a collage or a bookmark or, um, you know, any number of things. Um, the, the ability to reach out to your community, share what resources that you have to share and lean on each other um, for resources, for help, for support is really, really special. So I'm very pleased to hear that you're both having that experience with your libraries. Um, and I hope that that encourages other people to don't be afraid to ask. Um, you know, people love to give. Um, they love to be giving and they love to feel helpful. Um, so if, if you need support for your library, all you have to do is ask and people are bound to come um, to support you in whatever way they can, they can bring to the table. Well, thank you so much, um, both of you, for coming and chatting with us. I really appreciate hearing about your experiences, um, you know, getting advice on the practical piece and the emotional piece is really important because it definitely, you know, it can be a huge bummer, but it's also 
a problem that you can choose how to resolve. So thank you again for being here. Thanks for having me. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye. And before we wrap up today, um, I want to address a question we get a lot since our app launched. Um, what do I do if someone has reported my library missing or damaged, but it's not damaged and it is exactly where it has always been? Um, we are all still learning how to use the app, um, and that includes the staff who helps make it go. Um, so I know that it can be frustrating to get this kind of notification when you know there aren't any issues with your library. You know the neighbors still stop, stop by and are enjoying it. Um, so I wanted to share some tips today for resolving this issue. And um, Shelby and I did a little test to use my library at home um, as an example. So first, I would recommend reading the report details really carefully and checking on your library. This is, you know, I think it's the natural thing everyone does, but you never know. I personally don't use my front door frequently, so I only really look at my library when I take the dog for a walk and I come around the block and then I take a look at it and tidy it and all that. So there could be a problem I don't know about. Um, second, you want to check the map. Sometimes um, Google Maps fails us and our library ends up with a pin somewhere on the other side of town or in the middle of the ocean um, or any number of strange things that can happen on the back end of our map. So check it and make sure it's actually showing up where your library is really located. Um, and if it's not, reach out to us and we will help you fix it. That is, you know, an issue we'll, we deal with pretty frequently. And it's fortunately a really easy fix once we know about it. And the third thing um, you'll want to do, so you know that your library is showing up in the right place on the map. You know nothing's wrong with it. Um, you can resolve the issue in the app. So you'll see on this sample, I am in the app under my library and you can click on your library and look at the issues and you can see Shelby K reported library is damaged and needs repair, the latch is broken. In this example, um, Shelby shared an issue that could have really been an issue. Having that feedback about um, the specifics is super helpful because then if you go to look at your library, you know what to look for. But sometimes it just says library is damaged or library is missing and there's no other information. But in any case, um, whether this is true or not, uh, I can click resolve and then it goes away. And then you'll stop getting emails about it, which is ideal. And if you're not using the app, um, first of all, we would love for you to give it a try. But if you um, prefer not to use the app, just reach out to us. We can resolve those issues. We can help you confirm that your library is where it's supposed to be on the map um, and just help double check that someone's not confused or having a hard time finding your library based on the information that's online. Um, let's see here. Um, most often an erroneous missing library report just means that someone couldn't find it. Um, so consider you know, whether your map location matches where it's actually located. And um, think about whether the library is located somewhere that might not be obvious to someone who's never been there before. So if your library is located inside, maybe in the lobby of a hotel, for example, adding a little note about the actual location of the library can be super helpful. Sometimes people don't think to look inside of a business um, because they expect to see the library outside. So adding a little note um, using the location hint um, feature in the app is super helpful. And, um, you know, that's just one example, but it, sometimes our map pin puts the library roughly in the right spot, but a little extra hint could help somebody find it. Um, I hope these tips are helpful. Shelby is answering some questions in the chat about um, different things with the app. We have some really great resources um, for the help doc, help docs for the app online, which Shelby is going to share the link to now. Um, that includes some videos, some documentation, and um, we hope that you'll find it helpful. Like I said, the app is still new, so stewards and patrons alike are still learning to use it. 
And as a staff, as a team, we're still learning how to resolve issues and make the app work um, to its highest potential. So we appreciate your patience and we appreciate hearing from you when you run into issues because it's a learning experience for all of us and we want the app to be as useful as it possibly can be. And when in doubt about the app or anything, um, if your library is damaged or vandalized and you're feeling stuck, even with this information we've provided or what's on our blog or um, elsewhere on our, our website, reach out to us. Um, we're always happy to help in whatever capacity we're able to. Um, my colleagues and I, I promise, we see your messages when you use our contact us form. They come to a real person and we will do whatever we can to help you get back on your feet. So kind of like I mentioned earlier, if you don't ask, you don't know. So don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help and we will do what we can to get your library back in order. As always, attendees will receive an email in the next couple of days with a link to the replay, show notes, and you can sign up for a chance to win one of our book bundles. Um, and you can register for next month's episode of Unbound at the link in the chat. If you haven't already, we encourage you to follow Little Free Library on our social media channels and sign up for our e-newsletter. You'll stay in the know about future chapters of Unbound, exciting Little Free Library news, reading color launches, and all that awesome stuff. Um, and I am out of breath, but that was a lot of information, but I hope you found it helpful. Um, and if you need us, you know how to find us. Um, please reach out if we can be helpful to you in any way. And thanks so much again for joining us. We'll see you next time.